Morning Gadge. Morning Tom. Out here in the woods, lovely day. It's very tranquil. Um, so we're out here today to do another one of our webbing walks. It's been a while. It's been a while, so we're at two years probably, I think. Got to bear in mind, the first webbing walk we largely did because of uh, lockdown from the plague and pretty much the only way I could see Gadge because we couldn't meet inside. We had to go and do an outdoor activity with just one person. So that's largely why we kind of connived that first one and then lockdown rules changed. Yeah. However, it's been really popular. We've had loads of requests to do the next one. So for this one, we're going to be looking at the next stage, sort of, British Army LBE development, which is PLC or personal load carrying equipment. And we've got a couple of sets. Gadge has got my OD OG green set on. It's got a hybrid between an early and later set, isn't it, yeah. really? So it's got quite a lot of nice points to talk about. I've got my very heavily modified custom set of webbing, which we can talk about as well, because it's a nice way of seeing how things sort of progressed for the more serious soldier as we went on. Cool. Excellent. So, Gadge, how much does your kit weigh, roughly, or how much would you oh, weigh? Oh, do you know what? Right, it's not too bad because I'm not carrying any length, I'm not carrying any grenades, I'm not carrying real ammo, I've got empty airsoft mags, so it's a bit back heavy, I'd probably say it's about 7 kg maybe. Okay. So I've got an, pretty much an equivalent weight to the real stuff, I've got power banks and water and ballast rather than uh, airsoft mags in my mag pouches just to keep the weight up about right, and I'm uh, packed up to about 9, 9, 10 kilos. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, and the system for PLC changed quite a lot from 58 but we'll discuss that as we go on our little walk. Okay, so Tom's loadout weight is around about nine to 10 kg, with what he would use for airsoft patrolling with a real ammo weight to it. Now, what he's not carrying in addition to that is it's a folding and trenching tool you're issued and your bayonet, so you're probably adding another three to four kg on there. Some units let you keep your entrenching tool and its cover inside your Bergen or day sack. Personally, I kept the entrenching tool cover on my webbing and used it to hold my water bottle, freeing up my water bottle pouch for more useful stuff like a camping stove, wash shave kit, etc. You'd also have your bayonet on your webbing belt and it takes up quite a bit of space. It's about that wide and if you're a thin guy like I was back in the day, it's hard to believe I know, there was about 30, 32 waist, I actually had my bayonet fixed across the back of my webbing. Dug in a little bit sometimes but it freed up extra space for ammunition pouches, water bottle pouches, additional utility pouches, etc. because the amount of stuff you need to carry is quite considerable. The last time we looked at 58, if you remember, Tom, and 58 yep. was like a world of improvement over World War II, 37, 44 pattern webbing systems. But when they made it, no one had really thought about a nuclear, chemical, biological war, which is the big problem. So by the time it comes out in 1958, everyone's already starting to have kittens about the idea of the Russians bombarding NATO armies with tons of horrible, gloopy stuff. And the problem with 58 webbing is it absorbs water, as we mentioned before, it's terrible for it. And if it can absorb water, it can absorb chemicals and you can't decontaminate it. So you have to basically get rid of the whole thing, right? So the idea was to make a nylon, decontaminatable, more washable, less water absorbent form of webbing. And there was an initial trials pattern that was massively unsuccessful because the problem when you make things out of nylon rather than nice fabricy, grippy webbing is all these little buckles you get just slide off. And they weren't taping things up at that point either, in any real way. So you'd find that people would be running on their advanced contact, and they'd have pouches falling off behind them, the entire thing would come apart. Generally, not good. So the army perseveres with 58, with a few bits from the nylon kit, up until the 90s, pretty much. So I've just been doing a bit of background reading, Gadge, before we came out. And the kind of history of PLC trials is, seems like quite convoluted there's different branches of the army developing different bits of kit at different times for their own needs you know the needs of a light infantryman is different to the needs of a armored infantry 
they have different requirements. You need to carry different different amounts of stuff for different times, and that really didn't seem to help things very much. The other thing you kind of got is there was a kind of a trials pattern about 1975, and it was all integrated, so it was almost like an integrated belt kit. It didn't have a separate belt and pouches, and the troops really didn't like that. So initially they did, but when it came to actual kind of operational trials use, they ended up wanting more stuff and to change it around because it was set. You know, the ammo pouches were stuck to the water bottle pouches were stuck to the very much like your setup there, to be honest. It is, yeah. But this is personalised for one soldier. Yeah, and one job. And one job. It's not meant to be a universal all things for all men solution. So that got binned off, and then they looked at 58 Mark II. 58 Mark II was effectively 58 webbing, but made of more modern materials and nylons and some slightly updated fastenings. And as you said, the only real survivor of that is the resi bag later in 58, because that didn't really work either. So 58 pattern is soldiering on, but into the 60s, into the 70s, and then the 80s, the early 80s, obviously the Falkland War happens, and we have to use what we've got. There's a lot of development going on, but really there's a need just to get it out and get it working. You see some lacking things in 58 at that point, which lead on to PLC, the fact that everyone got issued in the teeth arms to a degree. Big Bergens, huge camping ones from civvy stores. You can see bright blue ones because they weren't enough. So they realise when they do do PLC, it needs something better than the 58 pattern large pack. Another thing that gets muted around this point is the idea of having all of your load carrying equipment kind of integrated into a sort of battle jerkin or a waistcoat. Now, you might think that's a great idea. It's been thought of loads of times. They tried it in World War II with the D-Day assault jerkins. Americans had them, the Brits had them. Not that popular. You see very few guys wearing them because they're hot, they're sweaty. You don't have the vents that Webbin give you to let you sort of breathe, really. And again, when this idea came out, while some people love the idea, it's not that flexible, you can't move pouches around, it is a one thing fix for one roll. development went on for a bit and at one point the waistcoat was kind of being trialled. Yep. It was, kind of, it was kind of like three options. There was an updated 58, there was a weight of was it like a Brecon waistcoat type thing that the kind of Brecon school were, were it's, pushing it's for. It's worth bearing in mind a lot of the recce platoons would make their own waistcoat type load yep. carriers for things like observation patrols etc. So, so they were really into that kind of idea. Yeah. And the third one was kind of what we got in the end PLCE which was a separate belt with pouches the real driver though was kind of the introduction of SA-80 or... Yeah, I mean that comes into service the mid-80s, I think the first operational ones are like 86, 87. So they really had to make a decision yeah. um, coming into that point about what they were going to go with. So they kind of kind of ran out of time. And if you read through back through some of the documents, they're not entirely happy with what they came up with, with the whole system. But it was, I think something to talk about right now is that it was a system. Rather than just a belt order, it came with a whole set of stuff. Yeah. So it's worth bearing in mind, Tom, that a lot of the, the design of this system is based around the three fighting orders or infantry orders. So you've got your fighting order, which is everything you need to do the assault and keep you alive in the immediate environment. Then you've got like your assault order that includes some rations and some NBC stuff, so you should be able to get by for a little while. And then you've got your marching order, which is like everything you can carry on your back to exist with. And the clever thing about it was, is it all kind of worked together. Whereas in the past, you saw soldiers adapting 58 with taping, all sorts of things to the back of it. Bungie's holding the lot on. 
old trouser legs with NBC suits in, and in this system, you, everything could clip together with the sort of ski clip things. Yeah. The Bergen we mentioned earlier had two big side packs, yeah. which, as you mentioned, we called rocket packs. They could be removed from the Bergen, put onto their own yoke, and then worn in that salt order. So, so what would go in the rocket packs? In theory, you should have your NBC suit and your boots in one of them, so you're always carrying your NBC kit. The other one would have ammunition, water, and I used to keep my basher in there because it was really handy to have it. So like your basic sustainment stuff? Yeah, it's, it's enough food for 24 hours, your NBC survival kit, and your, no, your, I kept my washing and shaving kit and other stuff in my actual wedding. Okay. But generally speaking, it was designed to keep you in the fight for a prolonged period of time, when you weren't around your burger. Okay. Now the initial release of PLCE was quite limited in terms of what you got. So if you go back and the documents are there, you can look at the fitting instructions for, for 90 pattern was the first release and in there you got left and right ammunition pouches you yeah. got a utility pouch a water bottle pouch and an entrenching tool pouch yeah and that's what you were issued you'll notice neither of these sets consist of any of that and i'm pretty sure most most soldiers beg borrowed and steal well, other pouches as soon as possible we we found this is back in the 90s when i was a reservist and we found that those two utility pouches and that water bottle pouch wasn't really enough for what you needed to carry, especially if you're taking a jet boil, because that takes it moments. So you can put your water bottle pouch in the entrenching tool carrier on yep. your belt kit, and it's quite easy to get to. It's a little bit easier than the actual water bottle pouch, to be honest. And that frees up a full pouch for, you know, rations or washing and shaving kits, spare socks, whatever you might want to have. And then you can actually put the e-tool in the little back pouch on the Bergen, which is conveniently exactly the right size for it. I'm pretty sure it's intended to go there as well, in certain orders. It's interesting though, because we've gone from 58, which people adapted to been carrying the entire world on them, to a situation where they've clearly decided to compartmentalise all of this stuff. Yeah. So a minimum amount of survival, effectively survival kit on the belt order, yeah. your sustainment living kit in your rocket pack pouches, or what we would now have in a, in a mm. day sack day or patrol sack. pack, and then you're living, living in the field, your house is yeah. in your Bergen, and had three, and they'd, they'd really staged that kind of stuff out. But it's interesting that even though they made that provision for the assault order, having the two rocket packs and a little separate yoke, and a little strap to stop it bouncing around, great idea, everyone hated it. So once you've gone out of your training at Catterick or wherever you might be, most people bought a 30 litre day sack and they crammed that in the top of their Bergen with the top flap. The top flap, it. Yeah, and then once they had to go on extended patrol, they'd take that out, ram in their NBC suit, ram in the rations they needed, put that linked GPMG ammunition or whatever in, yep. and just trot off with that instead. So while PLCE is great if you're light infantry, and by light infantry mean you're not travelling around in armoured vehicles or mechanised in any way, it's got a lot around the back. It's very hard to sit down in a Land Rover on the, on the seats of a 432, etc. So while it was a great new solution for soldiers in the 90s, and also the late 80s, you start to see people privately purchasing things like Arctis chest rigs if they're mainly vehicle born, or looking forward to commercial made battle vests, etc. Something the army will then take on board later and start making their own. Now, Gadge, yep. um, and we're going to have a little chat about kind of construction, makeup, and how the system goes together. Yeah, so with regards to the webbing, so the belt order. Yeah, so as I was saying to you earlier on, Tom, the actual core way of it being put together isn't that different from even World War One American webbing. So you've essentially got hooks and eyes that loop into a belt, metal hooks go onto holes in a belt. They're, 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 they're nylon loops now, and metal kind of like extended sea hooks yep. but the point being is that in theory is what we've been doing for years but yep. didn't always work you see a lot of people taping it in i think in this case you cable tied them on to be more secure yeah i cut the sea hooks off yeah and cable and heavy duty cable tied it in yeah and you see a lot of that customization where it's allowed but i think the key thing here is that we're looking at a mainly nylon construction yeah now yep yeah. so 58 webbing as we mentioned is a woven soft natural fiber and it could get heavy, it could get wet. This doesn't absorb water. 58 could almost double in weight if it got wet. And it could shrink a little bit as well. 
This doesn't change its dimensions, doesn't get wet. It can melt if you get a fireball on you. It can crack if you're in the Arctic, but they're fairly extreme conditions and the trade-off are actually not weighing twice as much in the rain in Germany was worth it. So one of the biggest differences again, so it's a few will go over between this and 58, but you know, one that immediately leaps to mind the fasteners. is the fasteners. Yeah. Now we used to call them Spanish fasteners because Spanish webbing at the time used that. And you'll notice there's three ways of doing this type of pouch up. You've got your simple clip like that, which is the fast and, and relatively secure way. Yeah. You can put that one through, and we'll zoom in on this in a minute, I think. And then putting it through pulls that one in behind it, and it's stupidly secure. It's not going anywhere, yeah. but it's slow to open. And lastly, you can just use the Velcro yeah. if you wanted to. So, yeah. so it's a lot better than the tab and loop the 58 webbing had. And if those 58 webbing tabs and loops got wet, sometimes they wouldn't even go through the metal hoop. Yeah. So that's, and these are polymer fittings as well. Um, now this is an interesting mix because it's got some, this is obviously it's OD, so it's part of first issue, but it's got different generations of pouches on it. It's got first, it's got first generation, second generation, and it's got some commercial pouches as well. So it's a real hybrid. So it's a real yeah. hybrid. Um, and it's got a, a tab belt. And it's got a tab belt. Yeah, now you wouldn't issue, we wouldn't be issued one of those, but they were a common purchase in garrison shops and that sort of thing. When I bought one because I was a thin guy, as I mentioned, and that tab belt gives you a couple of inches extra waistline, so it's easier to carry the amount of pouches you had to. Now, if you look, if you've seen some of our previous webbing videos, this belt fastening will be immediately cut off and replaced with a roll pin. <laughs> well, also, this is a really old yeah. system. This goes back to when, when that, was it? That's like 37 pound webbing users, pretty much the same thing. So, you know, some of this stuff yeah. is really a bit of a hodgepodge. Um, even, though, even if you do have, you know, it's quite a big juxtaposition between these brass hook fitting yeah. and these great big buckles. Classic ski clips. Now these would get yeah. cold and break. Yeah. People would, you know, tread on them. Tread, I broke several treading on them. Treading or they'd go yeah. to ground, yeah. land on a land on a stone and break these. So these yeah. often be removed and replaced with roll pin belts or another solution. There's several methods of attaching the pouches. Gadget talked about the first one already, which is where you get a hook which goes into these channels here. Later on, they started using tabs. It's quite hard. I'll show you. It's like a black metal tab that yeah, slides tab, into the loop. You get two yeah. tabs like that slide in. Isn't it, yeah, T tabs that slide yeah. into the same channel, and they slide in. And some of these pouches have that system on as well. I'll show you in a close up later because this is all assembled at the moment. And then even the attachments change. So if you look on this one, Gadge, that's very much like the sort of anodized metal you get on 58. It's probably already. exactly the same loop. Yeah, it's probably from the same stock. From the same stock, from the same manufacturer. Yeah. So, and then this chain, this method of attaching here changes to these, these instead. With the cutout triangle. Yeah. Now the reason, one of the reasons they did this cutout triangle is that you can put a utility pouch in place of these double mag pouches. And still use your front suspender. And still use front yeah. suspenders into, into yeah. at different angles for these these pouches yeah. here. Not many people did that. Some, I don't think I've ever seen it done. Some commanders did, yeah. but. But they were kind of vaguely thinking about it. Um, this also has really early ammo pouches, which still have just two divide, two compartments. Two compartments. The divider. Just about squeeze one in the front, two in yeah. the back. Most guys, I believe, uh, cut these dividers out, and then yeah, in, in subsequent issues, they just deleted the divider. Well, again, you wouldn't get a smoke grenade in one of those. Oh, no, yeah, I imagine that. Or, or you, you'll struggle to get a belted link in there as well, unless yeah. you put it in groups of ten, which would be pointless. <laughs> So this was designed around L85, L86, yeah. so 30 round 5.56 mags, so a different, you know, massive yeah. change to the great big... And, and when it was pack. designed, they were expecting to get rid of GPMG, and have LSW generally do that role in the infantry section. Well, I didn't think about belt. Yeah, much. so why would we want to carry belt was probably the logic at the time. Yeah. Um, right, so we've got... So these, these changed, not massively, but deleted the divider and changed the connectors. This is a this is issue. This is an issue utility pouch from 1991, yeah. rather than a water bottle pouch because it's bigger. We pretty much use them interchangeably, to be honest. Yeah. No, no one ever went, oh, you can't put up that in there because it's such and such, you know. Um, so you've got your water bottle in there right now. So these are great. You can get in and get jet boil. The jet yeah. boils obviously weren't around at the time. Lewis stoves and stuff like that. But you only got them. one of these, one water yeah. bottle pouch and one entrenching eatle pouch, entrenching tool pouch. This set has. <coughs> Two issue utility pouches, including this one. I'm just saying, we might have to be a water bottle pouch. That's a water bottle pouch. This has got water bottle pouch, utility pouch, and then two co commercial. Uh, these are actually BCB, early BCB stuff. Two commercial further utility pouches. And these are actually bigger than the 
than the issue utility panel. It's also worth mentioning that I'm borrowing Tom's set of web in here, so I've quite quickly loaded it with what <laughs> I would normal, normally carry. It's close to what I would have carried in my webbing back in the time, yeah. but that's why there's water bottle pouches in utility pouches and mess tins in water bottle pouches because I've just stuff in. But I think at the time, you know, I think the system that British Army had talked about was all well and good, but like as soon as that hits the field, like anything, guys just want to carry what they need on them, don't they? So they and they're, so they're going to start adding as many pouches as they can get around their waist to carry as much stuff as they can get. Because let's be honest, the logistics system very rarely is going to keep up with the pace of battle. And if, you're, if your Bergen's 48 hours away or a, a day away and is not coming up the chain, you're going to need, you're going to, need to live out of more stuff yeah. in your webbing than you yeah. wanted to. Uh, and again, that's why quite often you carry a bit of food in your smock. A bit. For, I'd always carry at least enough to keep me going for a day in my webbing. And the, the meal's supposed to be in my rocket packs, but to be honest, I'd have it, in, in, as you can see, in my mess tin. I've got a ready, boil, boil ready MRE type pouch meal in there, some candy mint cake. Yeah. And I've also got a NATO emergency ration I used to carry. Yeah. It's grim, it's like rock hard corned beef that you add to water and make soup out of it. But again, the theory is you might be just with your webbing for a week. Yep. Or you're webbing in an MBC suit and you can't eat MBC so suit. So you put the tack in yeah. and then you have to dig in and then there's a counter attack and there isn't time to bring all this stuff up and resupply you. Guys would also want to carry more water because you had one water bottle. Probably not enough, really. Which is why, as I mentioned, we'd use a spade carrier because it, it let you carry a second water bottle. Yeah. Um, so this, I think this is a really interesting set gauge. Yeah, the yoke's interesting as well, Tom. Just want to mention that quickly. Yeah. So we're keeping the, the H frame that both USM 56 and 58 pattern had, but again, it's nylon. But you've got this nice breathable mesh, so you've got more support than you would have with a, with a traditional H frame with the back straps. Yeah. But you don't sweat through it, so you're not having that rub and that Yeah, and it's got a nice space of mesh underneath. And again, well. inside you've got the same thing. And you've got these little loops here still that are a throw over things that you could attach things to if you need to, you know. I quite often have a radio pouch on there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, on my kit, if, um, if I'm in a command roll or something. But it's it? comfortable. It yeah. doesn't dig in, they're quite wide straps. Anything that touches your body is quite wide and quite relatively padded compared to previous systems. There's actually a little bit of a sponginess to that. Yeah. You know. So. There's a few more mods we'll talk about quickly on this before we move on. You'll notice I've got a bungee running attached, basically running all over the outside of all the utility pouches to keep the contents nice and constrained. Um, it stops these, if you're running, moving around, it stops them flapping around. And you can ram local foliage under them if you need to cam yourself up. If you like if you've seen our camming up video, really helps with that. So that's great, but obviously that's an addition, just cut out and stuffed in. And on the other side, again, another common one to keep the pouches together. As you'll be able to see, I'm going to show you close-ups. Yeah. I've got a U, I've got a black, completely civilian utility, utility strap, strap yeah. uh, woven through the bottom of all the pouches, just to keep them into a C, C shape and keep them wrapped around the body. And again, that stops them wobbling. So this set's really great. It really moves, really sits really nice yeah. and closely to the body. So bear in mind, when this kit is developed, it isn't a case of going to a civilian con contractor and saying, we want this, make this. There's a unit called the Infantry Trials and Development Unit, and they will get early patterns of stuff, and they will test it to absolute death. They'll try it in mud, they'll try it in ice, they'll try it in sand, they'll try and set fire to it, they'll run things over with it. And they'll say, this needs changing, this needs changing, but they'll only have it for a certain amount of time. But it might be a case of two years into the life of a piece of kit, maybe a jacket or some webbing, then the real wear starts to show. So that's when you might see soldiers going, we need to take this, or the bottom falls out of that, so we're gonna put a mug in there instead. Essentially, Soldiers will always find a better way to do things because they live with the stuff. Whereas the ITD, you guys, test it intensively, but they're not using it every day for years like a lot of guys are, and not in every situation. house on the hillside over there that's mine is it your other one the big hall yeah yeah that huge one that's the second home actually Tom. clifton hall yeah that's i just i just use that in the summer but uh it's a bugger to heat you know you can't do it all the time there must be a lot of money in airsoft media yeah? but there is there is i got paid so much 
Occasionally I buy him a pint. sum up our our feelings about PLC e-gadge. Okay so for me having used it for its real purposes and for airsoft I always found it perfectly adequate. It's not a glowing endorsement I understand that but it never let me down. It wasn't like when I've done Cold War events and not obviously real stuff or cadet stuff in 58 which is always an embuggerance. So for me definite step up. Personally I much preferred the Ops Vest that we'll look at in a future episode because I'm not a great fan of having everything cluttered around my arse like this, if I'm honest. I quite like to have my kit higher up. So I've never used either 58 or PLC in any sort of meaningful way really, other than for airsoft and a few kind of hikes in the hills. Um, I much prefer PLC for comfort. I mean that setup gadget has got is really comfy, really nice. Um, this is better, but this was custom made for a bloke about my size, so. <laughs> It would have been perfect then. Um, I think it's light years beyond 58, and there was a, that's some of the soldier fix, some of the some of the soldier fixes in 58 were taken through into PLCE. What I always find interesting with this stuff is what the people actually have to use the kit do to modify it, and we've shown a few of those today with the hip belts and the utility straps and the bungee straps and all sorts of stuff, particularly with this kit, which has been sewn. And I always find that really interesting. Um, one of the things I do want to show you is my 58 set, which has now changed completely since the last time we used it and we'll go through that in another episode as well. In general, I think this is a massive step up from 58. Uh, it's much more comfy, the load's better distributed, and that's part of the whole system thing. So you're not, you're not carrying all the NBC kit and ponchos and all that sort of nonsense that the guys were carrying back then, and pickaxes down their backs. I think it's a much more thought out system. Definitely potential to grow, um, but in all in all, infinitely better. So thanks for watching. I've been Tom Anvil Hibbard for AATV, along with my co-host, Gareth Gadge Harvey out on this beautiful day in sunny Nottingham. We're just gonna head back to the car. So goodbye from me. And me. So stay safe and we'll see you soon. Uh, we've got dog walkers. <laughs> that's, the, that's the way to start. That's brilliant. Brilliant. All right, let's move on. Oh. Of course, you don't know we've walked into nowhere, do you? Yeah. There's just a wall over there. It's a bit of what we call in the YouTube business special effects magic. <laughs> About the kind of construction of. Hello, doggy. Hello. Hello. Do you have tells? You're a nice man. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's food in there, yes. Yeah, great. Lots of food, but it's not for doggies. <laughs> Problem doing these shots, right? Is you have to come back and get the camera every time. So maybe what you should do is every time I leave the camera behind, you should drink two fingers.